with Lane Frontiers, and we are so excited today to have Raghavan, Oscar, Jamie, and Chris with us. You will receive a link to view the recording. However, it may take about 24 to 48 hours for this to get out to everyone. If you have a question, please use the Q&A feature down at the bottom of the Zoom toolbar. And I don't want to take up any more of their time, so I will hand it over to them. Thanks, Skyla. And again, thank you, Lean Frontiers, for putting this together for us. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I'll just Let me just introduce the um, three panellists before we get stuck into the questions that you've submitted when you registered for the webinar, which we really appreciate. There's some good structure here. Thank you. So Raghavan has a background in mechanical and industrial engineering. He was introduced to Lean Thinking in 2015 when he joined Norton McMurray Manufacturing. He is a TWI and standardized work practitioner and learner, and he's also very uh, heavily involved in the Association for Manufacturing Excellence in the Midwest region. Uh, he loves connecting with, other, with uh, other lean practitioners. And he's an ideal panelist on this because I know Raghavan likes to talk about what he's learned, which is, and what he's learning, which is terrific. So Jamie, uh, and the, the good thing about these three panelists is they're both pretty, they're all pretty practical people. Jamie started with discount tires in Phoenix, um, having finished college in 1981. He was promoted to a store manager in 1985 and started using lean concepts in his store in 1998 to improve quality and throughput. So Jamie's current role includes developing training in the use of, uh, in the use of monitoring and improving processes, tools and equipment and used in the service area. So lastly, but not least, Chris is a CI manager at Continental Structural Plastics. Uh, they are a global leader in the formulation, design and manufacturing of advanced composite solutions for transportation and industrial customers. So what is it the main uh, thing you make there, Christopher, that everyone could relate to? The bumper bar, that w the thing yeah. we we're working on. Oh, that was uh, um, basically the front end of uh, a Ford truck. That's uh, right. You know, that's right. That was, so a, that was that, the That's the sort of thing that Chris's yeah. companies makes. Um, uh, as a student and practitioner of lean technologies for almost 30 years, Chris has applied CI principles in discrete manufacturing process, manufacturing distribution service and office environments. And I should also tell you that um, as I understand it, Raghavan's company, Normac, they make the gas fittings or gas pipes, gas fittings, gas connections that connect from the mains gas to your house. So you may not see them because they'll be mostly underground, I imagine, Raghavan, is that right? Yep, mm -hmm. it's probably safe that you not see them. Yes, <laughs> fair call. But that's what those three companies do. So let's get straight into the, the questions. And again, thank you very much for submitting the question. So the first one, Raghavan, is for you and it's from Ben Chopping. And the question is, where do you start with step up one uh, of the five step up model? Uh, where do you start? Ah, that's a good question. Why do I have to go first? Um, so I think start with a, a coaching session with Oscar. Uh, from my personal experience, it is it was not that expensive. And the gains that I got from it was a lot more than what we really paid for. And I had eight coaching sessions with Oscar. And at each session, I learned something new that I could immediately take and apply to my work. So really, my advice would be start with a coaching session. Now, if your company's budget does not allow for it, what I would say is uh, start by asking what is normal. Every time you come across something that's not clear or or you, there's, there's ambiguity in something, just always start by asking what is normal, be it problem solving, um, be it training, just start there and you'll, you'll start seeing the value of what, of, of defining normal. Whereabouts in the plant? I think the question might be directed to more towards where in the plant. So where did you, uh, uh, how, how did you go through that exercise of deciding where to apply this model in the plant. I think the question's more directed towards that. Very kind of you to say what you said, but I'm not sure that's where the question's directed. Okay, I got you. So, so start at a process that is critical to your business where you might be able to see them immediate gains. Start at a process that is a bottleneck. Um, for example, I started at a machine that uh, produced parts that would go into every single 
um, assembly that comes out of NORMEC. Um, that really was a very important process for us. Call it the, uh, crit the critical link in the chain of processes. That is where you would wanna start this uh, defining normal because you'll be able to really see how that impacts flow in your process. Uh, that's what I did. I chose such a process and I was immediately able to see the impact. Uh, and it wasn't an overly complex machine. It just made a nut, didn't it, Raghavan? So yeah. it, wasn't mm -hmm. a it wasn't a complex machine because you don't want to choose something that's too complex to start with. Because yes. really that first thing is a learning platform as much as anything yeah. else. Yeah, yeah, thank you for adding that, Oscar. Yeah, you yeah, do not start with something complex, but still start with something uh, that is critical to your business needs. Yeah, good. Chris, I'll direct the same question to you, if that's all right. Where do you, where do you, uh, where do you start? Where do you feel you should start? And how do you feel you well, should start? You know, it's 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 funny because I was, you know, my notes say start with a mentoring session, um, because again, we get good uh, good guidance, and it, it kind of forces you along through the process. Um, start small in a focused area that's kind of contained so that you can, so that it doesn't, you know, get out of hand, I guess I would say. Um, I started on a process that uh, involved uh, kind of three or four different process steps, unique process steps. So that kind of helped me uh, or forced me to define things differently or depending on the, depending on the process. Um, and, uh, so that, that's sort of, that's where we, we ultimately started and, and kind of you know, start small, start uh, in a contained area so that you can kind of see the results as, as you're working through the, uh, through the sessions, through each of the steps from product to, to process to operator. And as I remember it, Chris, you actually started at an area that was sort of this size uh, and because it was yeah. making the actual grill, wasn't it? Make, yes. If I remember rightly. And then the whole, so you were lo really looking, if I remember it, you were looking at uh, a cell that had three operations in it. Was it three or four? Yeah. Three or uh, four, technically. Yeah, four uh, operations. So you were looking at that cell. And what we realized pretty early on was that that scope was too big. And you actually can brought it back to one operation. And yes, focused one, one, one of the one pieces operation. in the cell. And then later on, towards the end of the mentoring session, I kind of expanded it to a few of the other parts of the cell. That's right. But but early on, we went back to um, small it's, because it's, again, one it's yeah, one focus because it's a learning platform. Good. Uh, so, Jamie, uh, the question has come in from Silvio Eugenio, um, and it's explain better what it means by establishing normal before standardizing. Well, I, I think that was probably one of the, the struggles I also had with this is that we have, uh, we've standardized, you know, our work on everything that goes on in the back room. So uh, what do you mean by that? But with that first thing you've said, you felt you'd standardized all your work by everything what goes on in the back room. What do you mean by that? Well, we have standardized work documents on how you install a lug nut, how you remove a wheel, from a vehicle, how you install it. Very detailed instructions, uh, since I'm also involved with developing all the training. But then through this, I started as, you know, Raglan said, what is normal? And I started going, well, shoot, I started looking through all this training we're developing and nowhere in it does it really describe what normal is. All of our, our standardized processes were standardized, but it doesn't say if I'm looking at you know, if I'm looking at the process, how should this look operating normally? It was nowhere anywhere. <laughs> so really identifying that what is normal, how should it look is uh, to me, that's step number one before you get, let's standardize things because you, you're going to start working backwards and then people down on the, on the floor is going to start, start losing faith in you that, oh my God, you keep on oscillating back and forth. You know, identify what normal is first. Yeah, good. So can what, can you give an example of a real example? Because people will be able to relate to tyre changing, perhaps, more than perhaps the other two, which are internal uh, within factories. Can you give an example uh, that, the pub, that the people watching will be able to relate to? Because they'll know what we mean by a tyre and a tyre being changed. Okay. Uh, one of the things, and we worked on just changing a tyre on a, on a tyre changer. One of the things that was I thought was really simple was 
you have to take part of the uh, tire changer and it's called a duck head that basically fits down on the wheel. You put a pry bar in the tire and the wheel and you kind of rotate the tire around and it pulls the tire off the, the rim. Uh, I thought that was just normal. You just put it, put it down there, but no, you have to describe because there's different wheels that duck heads needs, needs to sit an eighth of an inch uh, above it on some wheels and a quarter inch on others. And that was just assumed that, hey, you just put it down there and people are gonna figure that out. Uh, whereas if it's not at the right distance, it can either damage a wheel or it can damage a tire. Good, so normal was dependent on the wheel, but it was an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch. So the yeah. whole point is that normal is something that was objective that could be measured. Yes, absolutely. Whereas it started with being subjective. <laughs> yes, yeah. and, and the key thing you said, if, if you don't define normal, then how do people learn normal? Yeah, they, I mean, basically, how many tires are you going to ruin before you learn what yeah, normal yeah. is? <laughs> or yeah, how so the many point, are you going to scratch? So, figure yeah, it out. The, the point there is they learn by trial and error. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the procedure may say lower the duck head. Yeah. But if normal's not described, quarter of an inch, eighth of an inch, or whatever Ooh. it may be for the wheel, then they learn that distance by, by trial and error, and there will be mistakes, there will be cost. There will yes. be quality issues. There may even be safety issues. That's the point. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah, good. So we define normal so we can teach normal right from day one. Yes. Good. Chris, have you uh, also noted um, you were interested in that question? Have you got one in particular you want to give an example there? Uh, a, des a description of... Uh, um, explain better what it means by establishing the normal before standardising and sure. a description of... Well, one, uh, one example um, that I have that uh, another uh, co-worker of mine worked on um, was when we bond two pieces of, uh, of SMC together, um, sheet molded compound or fiberglass sheet uh, panels, uh, we, put, we put some glue on there and then we, we, we bond it together. And um, sometimes that glue will squeeze out and we have to... Um, remove that, that excess glue because it, you know, it's, it's visible to the customer and it's a dissatisfier. Well, if you don't define what no squeeze out as, as being normal, then what you end up standardizing is fixing the abnormal. And uh, yeah, right. so what happens was, was, was my colleague kind of kept questioning, you know, squeeze out is not normal. And we go back to the glue path and we, once we fixed the glue path, we didn't have the squeeze out, so we didn't have to fix the abnormal conditions that we were causing by having that abnormal um, process. Yeah, good, good. That reminds me of the Peter Drucker statement, which is um, there's no greater waste than doing something really well that should not be done at all. That's essentially what was happening there. You were very good at fixing the squeeze out, uh, and but the whole point was it shouldn't have been there to start with. If we define normal for what the glue should look like, then um, then uh, we don't have to then and we get and we achieve normal, then we're not doing we're not becoming very good at something that shouldn't be done at all. Exactly, we're we're not becoming experts at rework. Yes, not adding value; it's costing us money. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting how that defining of normal actually once you define normal, it actually identify helps you identify what is what is rework uh helps you more clearly identify what is rework and what is waste because sometimes rework is taken as being normal part of the process which is what you're illustrating in your case yes so without first defining normal we wouldn't be able to do that correct so Raghavan, Keith Jones, thanks for this question. It's a good one. I, I think we'll, you can, you'll all have a crack at this one. Uh, it's Keith Jones asked, what were the biggest surprises you encountered? So Raghavan, could you go first on that, please? Yeah. <clears throat> so one of my biggest surprises was knowing how wrong I was or we were about the understanding of what normal was for the process. So for example, we had a machine setting on this 
machine that I chose uh, to define normal for. And along the way of defining normal, you know, we started, you know, pushing ourselves harder on, okay, what is normal for machine setting? And then we uncovered that our understanding of normal for six, seven years had been completely incorrect. So, and we thought we had a good hang of it. I mean, we thought we were experts at this and then we only found out that, you know, that was completely wrong. That's not how uh, normal was. So this is just one of the many examples where I was surprised to learn uh, how incorrect or wrong my assumptions of normal about a process where that was really surprising to me. Have you got a specific one you can illustrate? I know it's not, we can't see the machine. Have you got a specific example that you can recall? Um, all right. So, so there's this machine and it's, um, so there is like, um, we call it flats. It's basically a shaft that you'll have to adjust to set the uh, machine speed. So the changeover sheets we had, it said, you know, set it to, you know, a four, set it to an eight or whatever. And initially our understanding was that lower the number meant, you know, faster the speed of the machine and, and, and vice versa, higher the number, lower the speed. And our understanding of how to make the adjustment was also incorrect. But after defining normal, we came to understand that the process of setting the machine setting itself was a lot simpler than we had thought it was. So the higher the number meant higher the speed and the flats that was indicated on the machine setting was, was exactly that. Like you'll have numbers engraved on a cam and you'll just turn the cam to a limit switch, just make it contact that number and that was your machine setting. So, and I do not know how we made it so complicated. Somewhere along the way, we just chose to make it really complicated than it used, than it had to be. But defining normal really opened up our eyes and, and I was like, okay, this has been completely wrong. So, so what else do we have wrong about this process? Yeah, Let's right. go and look at what other aspects of this machine we have not understood properly. So, so the, the setting, the, the adjustments or the setting, as I understand what you said, the adjustments and the setting on the machine had become overcomplicated because there was really the, the, uh, the outcome you wanted had been lost sight of, whereas the outcome we wanted was normal on the, on the nut coming out. Therefore, as long as you bear, if you always have that in mind, then that will determine what your machine setting is. And, um, and you're always driven by that, but you'd lost sight of that as what you're being driven by is what, what I intend you to be saying. Yeah, that, that, that's a really good way to put it. Yeah. Good. Spot on. Thanks. Jamie, what were the biggest surprises you encountered? I think uh, whenever I first signed up for your mentoring, uh, I reached out to basically the director of our learning and development department and said, hey, you know, we're going to be doing this. And, you know, I'm just just kind of curious about, about your training. He goes, oh, we, we have all that covered. You know, we know everything, you know, we have the training, we have suit the nuts. So I go, oh, so the training's going to be defined, you know, how some, somebody should do it. Biggest surprise is that nowhere in there is there normal. And what we encountered, because I had two of the guys working with me on this, uh, basically what we were discovering is nowhere in any of the training. Uh, there is no defining what normal is in any of the, the training. Uh, entire change in anything we do. So that's what I was, that was what I was really surprised in. There is yeah. no normal in any of the training. Yes, I think it's something, it's certainly something that I learned a year ago when I, when we started to really look at this five step up model is that what I've noticed is people stand, tend to go straight to writing procedures. Yes. They jump straight to writing procedures without really being clear on what their writing procedures about, if that makes yeah. sense. So I, you jump I, straight I, into writing the procedure without being really clear on what normal is for the output or normal is for the machine or normal is for the process if you work in a hospital, whatever it may be. We go straight to writing procedures without considering those things. Therefore, the procedures tend to be or can be a bit ambiguous and can be open to interpretation. The critical bits are not there, are often not there. Absolutely. And, you know, real quickly, I ran... I ran another project at the same time, and this is one that I talked to you about, a simple process of pulling a car in and out of a bay. 
Oh, yeah, all right. Yeah. That is our biggest area of waste. Sometimes you, you're 30 to 40 percent of your efficiency goes down the drain because the base sits empty or a car sits there after it's uh, been done, finished, serviced. Crazy part is I had to define what normal is. And this is for an enterprise project. And when I took the simple approach of the step up model, all of a sudden people in the field are going, oh, this makes sense. Look, I just wasted three minutes without defining that normal first. Uh, they, they would have never got there. Right. So was that normal for the position of the car in the bay or yeah, the way and, it was written? Yes. And, and see, that's where it's, it's not only the positioning, what is normal, but it's also the time that it takes to get a car in there right. and get the car out. So it's, it's positioning. So just defining the normal, there's only about four steps to it. Yeah, right. And when, when people look at it, they go, oh, my gosh, this, this makes so much sense. So I, I guess applied it to something that's completely different than what we originally started with. Yes. And all of a sudden, the light bulbs went off with people in the field going, oh, this makes sense. I just wasted five minutes. Yeah. You know, when, when to us, you know, a, a car sits in a bay or our work time somewhere about 14 minutes on a car average. Yeah, right. uh, regardless of what, what it is. And if you add on five minutes, that goes to 19 minutes. That's huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you think of the number of cars uh, yeah. in a number of stores across America, there's a fair bit of um, potential there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah they're it's, moved into that base. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Chris, what were the biggest surprises you encountered? I think uh, my biggest surprise was with, uh, with the operators that I worked with. Um, out at the on the shop floor, um, I was very pleasantly surprised that they were they were always extremely willing um, to assist, to explain, to help, to try out. Because you know, I in the end, at the end of the day, they were they were frustrated because again, normal isn't very necessarily defined. So they're just trying their best to make a part and uh, to make parts so that they can. Uh, feel satisfied and go home at the end of the day and not have to work weekends or too many weekends. So I was, you know, whenever I went out to, to the cell to, uh, to get information and discuss, uh, I never had a problem with the operators um, providing me with information details and, uh, and their expertise on how the process was running at, the, you know, at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And um that's good. And what I remember from our discussions was that, that the, you were getting different interpretations from different people on the same job or the same output. It was different interpretations from different shifts from different people on the same output. Because we didn't very, we didn't define normal at all or very well um, in some cases, but uh, in other cases we did not. Uh, we would get that variation from from shift to shift, from, from day to day. Um, and so you, you couple that with um, some turnover issues, uh, we'd get new people into the cell and uh, that would cause variation again because we, well, we didn't define normal very well. So the interesting thing that I find, and this is certainly, this is what you're talking about happens in the, with the winery and the other organizations we're doing this with, is that the key thing I heard you say in that sort of couple of minutes, Chris, <clears throat> was the operators are doing their best, or you said the work to that effect, words to that effect. Yeah. The operators are trying, they're doing their best. So in their minds, they are defining normal. You ask them what normal is, they will tell you because they've defined it in their minds. The problem is that it's different in each of the minds yeah. of the different operators. Yeah, so and also, can you just comment? If, if things aren't going well, they will start experimenting. Yes. To get things to appear to be normal, to, to be able to get good parts out of the back end of the process. Yeah, yeah, right. So unfortunately, I think it's because we don't have adequate management support to, yes. to support them, help define normal, and get the right people in to problem solve. Yeah, They're good. doing it themselves. And just to clarify that, there's nothing wrong with experimenting. We want them to experiment. We want our operators and our frontline leaders to experiment with our processes and aim to improve them. But 
what the, the problem when there's experimenting and you don't have normal defined what is that yeah that's just that's taking shots in the dark it's it's, it's that's right it's really not it's not truly experimenting scientifically it's just kind of it's guessing it's it's it's, yeah. it's random it's there's, I think that's a key point here is we want people to experiment, uh, but we need to them experiment. And I've seen Mike Rother do this. We want people to experiment within the boundaries of risk. And that boundaries of risk is don't, don't create abnormal. Right. Within, uh, you have to know what normal is to experiment. You have to, that's right. You have to know what normal is to be able to design and conduct a good workplace experiment. You have to know what normal is. Yeah, well said. Raghavan, you were nodding through that, I noticed. If you Could you relate to that specifically? Uh, yeah. So I had mentioned earlier that I started asking the question, what is normal with problem solving? So if you don't define norm, earlier, I used to ask the question, what is standard work and what is actually happening? And I used to treat the gap as a problem, right? If you don't have normal defined, then each person has their own interpretation of normal. Then sometimes abnormal becomes the norm. So when you ask the question, what is standard work? They'll tell you what their version of standard work is, but the problem is they just mentioned something that is abnormal. So you're going in trying to attack something, thinking that it's a problem and it, when it may not be a problem or when it may be a different problem to attack. And that's why, I've been finding immense value in just asking the question, what is normal? And when people are not able to give a clear and concrete answer of what normal is, and I keep pushing them, they get frustrated, yes. But once you get there and define what normal is, your problem solving becomes a lot easier. Yes, because you're starting from a consistent and level base rather than mm -hmm. a point of interpretation. Yep. Good. Uh, Jamie, did you have a particular, oops, sorry, did you have a particular example that you were thinking of there where you can illustrate that? Yeah, it's, uh, I use what is normal in that probably about 20 times a day uh, to the point that I even have senior vice presidents of operations when they go into the field starting to ask, okay, what is normal? Show me, show me what is normal and explain to me why that's normal. Uh, and it just, it's, it's really change because now everybody is starting to see see things the same way instead of interpreting yes yeah good and so for people who are listening obviously we've got three manufacturing people here but i hope what you're seeing is that this concept these guys are talking about or we're talking about that could be applied in any work environment and it doesn't have to be manufacturing it could be a and i'll use healthcare as an example a hospital environment you know i can use the gaining the um the vaccine um, when this, the, the, the job of giving someone uh, or vaccinating someone for the virus, when they're sitting there ready to be vaccinated, what is normal in terms of the setup of the environment? Uh, you could do, that would be very easy to define. The, the way the needle is put in would be very easy to, to define what normal is. So that's what these guys are talking about. What's our, how's our environment set up? How's our equipment set up so we can clearly identify normal, abnormal. Then it's easy to identify where we have a problem and start genuine problem solving. Uh, good, so, the, so my point there is we've got three manufacturing people here, but this concept of normal, abnormal can be applied in any work, no matter what it is or where it is. So another question, and look, I've skipped, I had them, I had them in order. So this is perhaps a little bit out of order, but then maybe not because we've established a platform for this question. So David Asuna has asked, this is for you, Chris, initially anyway, what should be the overall organization's preparation process before starting with step up one? That's a, that's a loaded question. <laughs> well, um, where to start, you know, again, you know, practice starts small as, as you're learning. Um, what we're trying to do, we, we found in our business that we, we already, a lot of the stuff is already being done um, as far as um, defining the, the, the part, you know, the first element of, of step up one. You know, our, our product engineers do a good job of interfacing with the customer and getting that information out. Um, and then that jumps to our tooling engineers who then are 
putting together the, the processes and, and the equipment to, to meet those, those product specifications. And then, um, and we do a pretty good job there too, not, not perfect, but then uh, the, the third element, uh, getting to the people and the plant, um, our process engineering, we develop our work processes. Unfortunately, a lot of the, it's the classic throw it over the wall um, mentality. So, so some of that normal, that, that normal doesn't get defined throughout the whole process. So, so what, what we're doing, how to, how to get started, uh, how to prepare, you know, we're trying to integrate this into our, into our new product development process so that we can, like Jamie was saying, kind of keep asking that question, what is normal every step of the way? Um, I think we've realized that it's an iterative process. So as we, as we learn more about the equipment and then the process, we might feedback and make changes to the process or go back to our customer and make and, and, and petition for adjustments. Um, and so that's where we're trying to, uh, to get started to integrate this into, into our organization. Uh, more specifically, um, we're trying this out. We're actually trying this pilot out on a uh, in-source pro process. So we're bringing some products back in-house that, that we paint and assemble at a subcontractor. So as we bring those processes back in, we're developing those, those normal documents for the product, the process, and the people so that we get it right and we don't hit the wall and, and uh, potentially uh, compromise our, our customer as we make that transition, bringing it in-house. So on that particular one, how did you actually prepare the people or the, pe the people who are, the way I read that question is before we actually start applying the pr principles and philosophies of the step up model and step up one, how did you prepare the people? How did you m get them ready to, to think this, to start to think this way? It's really, really it's, we kind of learn by, by doing, we're mentoring the people as we, and again, we're using this in-source project as our, as our, as our mentoring project. So as we are bringing in, as we're developing the, uh, the work cells at the plant, um, we're kind of using that, that same process you used on developing the, uh, you know, asking them what's normal and, and documenting the specifications and actually kind of getting down into the details um, to know what's normal every step of the way and questioning every step of the way. Is yeah. it necessary? Is it normal? So we're kind of training the people by doing. Yeah, that right. We bring this product back in. A couple of you, maybe you want to comment on this, Raghavan. A couple of you have mentioned frustration. It's certainly something I've, I've found. And I've got one supervisor that I'm working with at the moment on a winery building their capability in this. And he's pretty right now, but four weeks ago, I know I was annoying him. I could tell by his body language that I was irritating him because I was really pushing him on, it was to do with the cardboard box uh, that the wine bottles were going in and the shape of that box when it goes into the, what they call the spider, which puts the bottles in the box. So I was pushing him on defining the shape of that box when it went into the spider. Because I know that if that box is the wrong shape, the spider jams up. So I was pushing and he was getting, he was getting frustrated. He was getting irritated by my, me pushing him. So um, I'm interested to know, both a couple of you have said that people have found it frustrating. How have you have, how have you handled that? Well, um, so the way I handled frustration. Um, so by really explaining the why. So with the specific operator that I was, uh, you know, pushing to help better define what normal was, he was getting frustrated. And he's at one point he said, "Well, what's the whole point of doing this? I mean, we've been doing changeovers for like a long time. I've been setting up machines for like years and years and." I don't think there's anything you can add to this that I don't know about. And I said, okay. And he also said, we have training in place. We have job breakdown sheets and we're pretty good at this. And at some point along the way, I asked him, okay, you have a job breakdown sheet training, you're training someone, but what is normal when someone performs the task? What is the expected outcome? Do you know, like what is normal here? And he said, well, this is normal. And he, like, can you better define it? So three people, observing the process can all say this is normal and this is abnormal. All three people can give you the same response. And then he said, okay, I see what you mean. So when, when, you, when you get 
a person A and B and C, when they look at this process that you've designed, and can they all say that is normal and that is not normal? If they cannot, then they probably cannot all problem solve the same way also. So, and he was able to um, understand the value of defining normal. Uh, and, and, and he's been a big champion of defining normal ever since. Like he, he keeps pushing me now on what normal is. So it's, Good. it's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, the next question I have here is from Eric Hansen, and it's for the three of you. And uh, perhaps, Jamie, you can go first. So Eric asked, what has been the most challenging part about using the step-up model? What has been the most challenging part about using the step-up model? The most challenging part for me was stepping into the eyes of a new operator. <laughs> and yeah, because, you know, I've, I've been in this world for 40 years and I've been doing- So you know tires. Yeah, I know <laughs> tires. And let me tell you, I've been working on continuous improvement uh, on installing them for, my gosh, for eons. Well, the thing is, I speak a different language than a new operator would. Uh, so what I think is logical, I go, oh, this makes sense. This is what normal is. They're like, oh, what are you talking about? So to actually take a step back into a brand new operator and give them something that is so simple of what normal is, that they just go, oh, wow, okay, this, this makes sense. So that was my, my biggest struggles, looking through somebody's, somebody else's eyes. Yeah, the challenge of looking through. Yeah, it's great. That's it is it is very very difficult. But if it's a skill you can develop, it'll take you a hell of a long way. But it is tremendously hard for someone who's super familiar with a job. Yeah. Just before the before the rest of your answer, the question, I just want to share something on my screen, uh, everybody, and that is you should see the screen now. So this is a poster that um, uh, we used during the training. And I think it's worthwhile putting this up now. And it's a statement that was made by Ma, uh, the, it come from the Lean Thinker, December, 2019. If you don't have a clear expectation of what good looks like, then your definition of not good, so uh, abnormal is subjective and varies depending on who, on who, what, and when things are being looked at. If you don't have a clear expectation of what normal looks like, then your definition of not normal uh, is or abnormal is subjective. So I just wanted to throw that up there just for people who might be new to um, uh, not have a lot of background in this step up model. That is what these guys are talking about. We want to get away from that red poster situation. And that red poster situation exists in um, uh, uh, many, many, many organizations. And it's not there uh, deliberately. I think it's sort of hidden under the surface in a lot of ways. We write these procedures, we jump straight into writing procedures and we bury that red poster issue in those procedures sometimes. We can't see it. Um, so, uh, uh, Jamie, you just answered. Chris, what was the most challenging part about using the step up model for you? Well, uh, I'd say two things. One is defining normal. Um, especially because when we have uh, painted surfaces, um, one, of our, one of our products, uh, the, the body panels for the Corvettes, uh, which is high-end vehicle, so people are very discerning. Even our customer, the assembly plant, is very discerning about the quality of that painted surface once, uh, once they paint it. We provide them a prime surface and um, they finish it. So that's still very subjective and we're, we're trying to and it's going to take a lot of time to fully define um, what normal is uh, for those types of types of products those panels yeah because i can imagine paint is uh is an appearance thing so beauty is in the eye of the beholder that's the problem <laughs> how do you define and there that? are there are specifications on lots of different paint um qualities but still it ultimately comes down to do they like it or don't they like it and it's still yeah, yeah. activity that is going to be very challenging for us going forward 
So is it just not? It's not just color. I don't imagine, Chris. Is it smoothness? And it's it's yeah, it's smoothness. It's it's glossiness. You know, it, orange peel is is a term they use. It's kind of the the, the kind ah. of surface looks. Um, there are other blemishes and defects that can possibly come up through the process during the pro process of uh, painting, where you're you're heating and cooling the part and. And uh, the, the part might behave uh, erratically, but uh, hopefully we've molded the part correctly so those those defects or blemishes don't don't appear. Yeah. So I mean, so Very what you want at the one. end is, if for someone to be able to look at this part and to look at the standard that describes normal, and everyone come to the same decision. Yes, it's exactly. good. No, it's not. And that's, that's very. In something like huge. that, that would be super that's challenging. Take, it will take a long time for us to get to that. Uh, final point. I think that's yeah. the biggest challenge. I also found on the process side um, at our plants, so many, what, as we go through this process, we find so many of our processes need maintenance and, and, and adjustments. And as we define what normal is, um, you know, as we better get better at defining normal, I find a lot of our processes and support processes need support and maintenance that uh, they don't have quote unquote time to take care of because they're they're taking care of big issues or important issues and those are minor issues. So yeah, those sure. issues get put by the wayside and it perpetuates the abnormalities that uh, that occur in our processes. Yeah. Good. Well so said, thank you. Fixing and maintaining equipment is another challenge that uh, mm -hmm. this is sort this is showing us that we need to fix. Yes, because one because and so so one of the <clears throat> so stating what's normal for the condition of a piece of equipment is important in this, isn't it? Because it's, in, it's it's an input. It's, we found that absolutely. at the we found that at the winery, which has been the platform for a lot of what I've learned, is that that the that the, you need to state normal for the condition of the equipment because that's an input into producing normal in the output of uh, producing normal in the output. But that's good because what that's allowed us to do now at the winery is for uh, operators to do, to do a normal check on the condition of the equipment and let maintenance know before it breaks down and before it falls apart uh, and before it starts damaging the equipment, uh, before it starts damaging the output. Mm -hmm. So that's been valuable. Raghavan, we're running a bit low on time. We've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, what has been the most challenging part about using the step up model for you? And thanks again, Eric, for that question. Um, the first challenge is the degree to which you define normal, because when you learn a new skill, uh, like defining normal, I set about to start defining aspects of normal that were really not required for the product from a customer's point of view. So I call uh, them distractions. So you gosh. start, you start putting a lot of information on a document and then those are really distractions. The operator does not need to know those really to make a good product. So first challenge is really knowing the extent to which you should define normal. The second challenge is after you define normal, the abnormal will become obvious. And now you're gonna have, well, I had operators who told me, well, this is abnormal. Certainly we solve this and get it back to normal before continuing on. Well, there's an explanation to that. Not everything that's abnormal can be brought back to normal because in some cases, it's just not economically viable for the business, right? So that's, that, that is another challenge that I found. So I tell people that there's three different things. There's normal and there's exceptions which are made because going back to normal is not economically viable. In other ways, fixing the root cause is not economically viable. And then there's something called outright violation. It's not normal. You've not been granted an exception, but you still venture on to do something because of your own understanding or interpretation of normal, and that's a violation. So the second challenge really is getting people to understand that uh, there are reasons why you have exceptions. And uh, when you really explain the why, people are pretty good at understanding it, uh, but it is a challenge that I'm working through. Yeah, good. Now that raises the point that we've had at the uh, winery where we've had a authority to run on red is what we've called it. In other words, you have an abnormal situation, but it's commercially unviable to fix it then and there. So therefore we give authority to run on red. Um, and that's been a really important 
learning journey for people. They must get authority to run on red, which is authority yes. to produce abnormal. Um, exactly. And, it, and then it's flagged. Yep. Terrific. So, so we're out, we are out of time. It was a, a, a 45 minute session. I just want to raise one more thing and it's Jennifer Condell, who's one, obviously watching has put in a um, comment there about uh, defining what is normal to establish standard work in healthcare is often challenged by staff with the response we customize to our patient. But the, what I really like about Jennifer, what you've written is the power of, of observation has really helped me coach staff and being able to have a different perspective. So I think what normal abnormal does and what step up one does is build the power of observation. I've certainly found that in myself. It's really built my strength, my power or my ability to, to observe objectively and ask the right questions. So that power of observation comment, I really like Jennifer, thank you. So Jamie, Raghavan and Chris, thank you very much for the time um, you've, uh, you've put together in the work you've done, but also in participating in this, uh, in this webinar. I've really enjoyed the discussion and enjoyed your insights. For those of you who are watching and are interested in the workshop I attended, there is another one coming up on the 21st and 22nd of April, which is a starting workshop, which we'd love you to uh, have a look on the Lean Frontiers website. It'd be fantastic if you could attend that. And anyone who does has the opportunity to do the follow-up mentoring and coaching that, um, that Raghavan mentioned at the start. It's really, you know, the workshop starts you, but you only really learn through practice. And that's what the follow-up's about. So Chris, Jamie, Raghavan, thank you. Uh, Skylar, do you want me to hand back to you or we stop there? Have you got anything you want to wrap up with? I was just going to follow up with your workshop. Um, just a reminder to everyone that you will receive a link to view this recording. Um, but everything else, you guys have a good day. And thank you, Oscar, Jamie, Chris, and Raghavan. You guys have a good day. Thanks. All right. Thank Bye. You. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks thank for you. everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, Thank everyone. you. Bye-bye. Thank you.